a lot of people, but you know, we get, I don't know, attendance is, is kind of up and down, you know, I guess people are a little stressed financially. So, but there's definitely a lot of good people, a lot of like-minded people that are deciding that it's time to get something done. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. I think, um, I actually think the pandemic might have something to do with that, honestly. Yeah, because suddenly people are realizing that they they can't depend upon uh, the system to meet their needs. And it's everything, everything it's doing is harmful. Um, And that's where, you know, uh, like your material, you know, you're talking about creating a less fragile lifestyle for yourself. Exactly. You want to kind of share uh, what that looks like or you know some of the you know just general discussion of that whole idea of not i mean i look at it as the solution is to become responsible having the ability to respond you know if the grocery store runs out of food or my job runs out of money then you know i'm dependent 100 percent on a system of of people that have proven they 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 will not do the right thing and so you know, what is it that makes us resilient? What can we do uh, to, uh, you know, take responsibility for ourselves and build a better world? Yeah, no. And what I always liken it to is, um, you know, I grew up a dog breeder and then I actually recently stopped dog breeding because it conflicts with some of my new philosophies about just nature and everything. But, um, but it, I always use this example that like a dog is completely domesticated. Mm -hmm. So if, if, you know, God forbid I was to pass away, you know, my dogs would starve to death if no one could take care of them because they were never taught how to take care of themselves, right? They didn't have a wild dog mom or dad to show them the ropes or a pack to, to show them how to survive in the wild, where to go, where not to go, what to do, what not to do. And at this point, they are genetically different than, let's say, a, a wild dog in, in Africa, you know, right. for example, or a dingo, you know. And because of that, you know, they are a lot more vulnerable and fragile, you know. Yeah. Um, and so humans are we're self-domesticating, you know, and and if we are domesticated, the government kind of becomes like the master by default, the government, if not the government and the corporations by default become like the masters because in the same way that my dogs, you know, they wait in the morning, they're waiting to hear me walk down the steps, right? They're like, man, when is this food going to get here? And in the same way that we're like, Hey man, when, when is my boss going to send that check? When is the, when is, when is this going to be restocked in the grocery store? You know, um, because we depend on them. And so, you know, FAMS is a return to, you know, a mentality that was natural to us, which is like you said, we got to be responsible. You know, it's just that, you know, in, if you look up any hunter gatherer group, you know, of any sort, not just the adults. I mean, they'll show you eight year old children hunting, foraging and making fires. Right. making bow and arrows i'm like what like yeah i can't do any of that right like, i'm just <laughs> you know i'm just yeah. learning how to I, you know and so and so that's how but that's the gap that is now you know and so the entire fam system is pretty much you know um a system outside of what i call the matrix and i mean it by a very you know general definition which is just a medium or a structure in which something develops in right and you have good matrices and you have bad ones a good one is something's natural environment a bad one would be the zoo right Right. like you know and we live in a giant zoo (laughs) you know that's what i tell people we live in a giant zoo that we made Mm -hmm. and so fams is just you know a system of allowing us to go back to be in our most natural responsible selves Mm -hmm. while at the same time still uh keeping some of the technologies that are still advantage, you know, um, are still good for us to have. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, I can't help but think of, you know, like early in childhood when, um, you know, in my time in school, you know, they used to beat you with boards if you weren't <laughs> behaving, right? Yeah. And um, 
the best times I ever had was escaping that domestication into nature where there's nothing but what's true before you and you could create and build and there were no limits to either your happiness uh, or your pursuit of something more. And in yeah. that, I learned to eat out of nature at, at the time it was still possible. Um, and so it, that rewilding, I mean, like you said, your dogs are waiting on you to bring the food and our whole system is built upon an industrial farming system that is, it's going to end. I mean, we, we export more value in topsoil down the Mississippi river every year than our entire domestic production. And, yep. you know, here we are waiting just like my dog, you know, she, she managed to kill a rat. She doesn't know what to do with that. I mean, like, that's, what, what is this? Like, okay, I did that. I'm, I'm done playing now. Where's my food? <laughs> exactly. And another good example of that, let, let me ask you, are you, do you eat meat? Are you vegetarian? Like, are you pescatarian? Like, just to ask. Well, you know, I would rather be frugivore, but I'm having, you know, I have lived for up to three months straight on just grapefruits. But I have struggles because it's not something that I can always obtain and it's not always ripe and therefore not nutritious. Um, and so we've moved to the desert now and we're actually building a courtyard to block out the hot, dry wind. We've got uh, berms and ponds to catch water. We're going to be building a 30,000 gallon tank and we're going to be building a food forest right in the middle of this little courtyard. That's and awesome. so... I'm on my way, but I literally walked away from the system and am starting life literally completely over from zero in some of the cheapest, most um, undesirable land uh, that you could possibly find. And yet I see that as I'm out here now, I'm realizing that there's actually food just kind of growing all over the place. And yeah. so, you know, I want to move to a more frugivore plant based diet. You know, I still you know, we still eat eggs and um yeah. whatnot so i i don't uh, know I, it's still a new venture to keep my health intact the the reason why i ask though is this right and so um some of my vegan and vegetarian friends get get a little um offended just as some of my carnivore friends get offended by this but what i say is like there is no organism on the planet but humans that have an ideology connected to their diet like mm -hmm. nothing else i've watched a deer right eat a bird I right. watched the chicken eat a mouse, right. right? When it comes down to it, it's just cost and benefit. They're like, listen, man, I just, I'm just eating what my body needs. And it's, yep. it's that simple. My body needs mostly, you know, uh, like a deer. My body needs mostly grass, man. And, and mm -hmm. you know, some, some leaves here and there. That's what I eat. But yeah. my body tells me I need a bird, man. And there's a bird next to me. I'm going to eat it. And so right. the reason why I bring this up is because one of the signs of domestication is that you know, um, it's for some reason, a lot of creatures that get domesticated, you know, live uh, food that they've killed becomes extremely gross. Right. Like, I don't kill a dog. You know, the first time I tried to put my dogs on a raw diet, which their bodies are still created for, right? Yeah. They're not created to eat these giant grain diets that yeah. we're kind of forced to feed our dogs. The first time I put that in front of my dog, he looked at it like... <laughs> what the hell? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do with this? Yeah. I'm like, eat it. It's like, bro, I don't, you know, like he's looking, he's looking at me like, I don't, like, I don't know what to do with this. You want me to eat this? And right. when he finally did get the hang of it, he loved it. But I just remember the first couple of days, it was like, what are you putting in front of me? And so I always bring that up and because humans ate, um, you know, just looking at our ancestors, a vast majority of fruit and vegetables. Right. More fruit and vegetables than protein, but not because they were just like trying to do that. It was like it's everywhere. There's fruit on the trees, and vegetables here. It's everywhere. And yeah. hunting, you know, um, you know, though we were hunter gatherers, hunting and fishing is a lot less successful than foraging. It's just the nature of it. Well, you know. First of all, I kind of you know you you hear all these stories about the old. The old, good old days, right? They were never good, for one thing. But if we had to go back, like at the Depression, when everybody started turning to hunting the wild game, suddenly there was none. And we have an even more depleted environment now than we had. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think part of rewilding ourselves, too, has to be that you have to learn to not stick to a creed, right? You've got to, you've got to follow your gut, you know. 
yeah, I love eating vegetables and I think I can live entirely on fruit. But if my body tells me you need to go eat a cow, then sorry, cow. Yeah. But sorry. the balance of that is naturally, if you have to go kill something and get inside of it and prepare it and eat it, I find that most people don't really want to eat so much meat. You know? Yeah, no, yeah. But I mean, that's another misconception because, you know, not not what you're saying, but like a lot of meat eaters, this is where my meat eater friends get mad at me because they look at hunter gatherers and they think like they look at the Hatsa tribe and say they eat a lot of meat. I said, well, you got to remember that civilization has pushed them a lot further out into places that has a lot less vegetation and fruit, meaning right. they're going to have to eat more meat than they normally would mm -hmm. just because there's not as many fruit and vegetables in root plants as there was in, you know, most humans prefer tropical places. Mm -hmm. Even today, people go vacation in tropical places. It's just our natural environment. Normally, a tropical place or a very heavily wooded place next to a beach because right. you get best of both worlds you can mm -hmm. you can go ahead and eat you know the 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 seaweed you can eat some clams and, and you got the the fruits and the vegetables in the in, in the woods and you don't have to work as hard you know to yeah. to eat or risk injury trying to hunt like you know everybody always pictures humans hunting mammoths and i'm always <laughs> like yeah humans hunted mammoths but if they if they, that's because they were in places where it was so cold and frigid that yeah. It was like, bro, we got to. We don't want to because I don't want to get hurt. I don't want this yeah. thing to hurt me, you know. And so yeah. that kind of goes back, though, to, you know, rewilding. Like one thing that humans do now that we didn't do in the past is like what you were saying, like over hunting, over killing. Like we, we yeah. overkill now. You know, if we go out, um, for example, we might hunt something just because it's not good for, you know, the farm. Mm -hmm. You know, we might go kill out, you know, a thousand wolves, throw off yeah. the ecosystem completely. And now you got places like, man, we got to reintroduce the wolves because this ecosystem could, could completely die out. Right. And, you know, so like you said, there's a there's a balance in nature and um, we're living so far out of our diets. The reason why, you know, I originally brought it up, we're so domesticated mm -hmm. that we're confused about our diets to the point where you have people saying, I'm not going to eat anything but meat, you yeah. know, anything but meat. And what happens when you go on a vegan diet, a meat diet, is your body naturally feels really good at mm -hmm. first. The reason why is because normally the same people who go on vegan diets and meat diets are eating organically. And so yeah, what's yeah. really happening is your body's just so happy to get off all the junk. Yeah. So that's why you hear meat eaters say, I feel great. I feel mm -hmm. awesome. And yep. same thing as vegan's going to say is, but that's more connected to you're not eating these GM, G, GMO, you know, uh, you know, artificially similar, like, you know, foods. Yeah. So you're by celebrating it, you know? Yeah. I think that um, I can't remember what the doctor's name was, but he was into like, uh, he was a bone surgeon and neurosurgeon. And he was explaining the cycle of light energy and, and the energy that's stored up in the fruits and stuff. But when you're in a cold climate, when you're off of that tropical equator, there's things that you ultimately have to have that you really can only get from animal products. And, you know, it's the kind of thing that makes me scratch my head. It's like, are we really from this planet? I mean, like, because we're like the only thing in the northern hemisphere that we, we like, how would you get through the winter if you had no coat, and no shelters? Like you have to wear clothes, you have to put on uh, or put up shelters, you have to do all of this stuff. Um, and, and then we can't just walk out the door and find what we need. And I find that, I, I don't know, I don't know, like a lot of people, or for me anyway, I guess there's starting to be this spiritual growth. And you start to realize there's this, there's this balance in all things. So you can't be purist all one way or the other because your body may need something like the, like saying hunting a woolly mammoth. Yeah. They, they were so far in the North. That's all they had. And for a period of time, that's what you had to do. Um, yeah. and, and two, we have to realize that we can't not build our resilient lifestyle because it's not ideal. Um, I've had people come to our workshops, you know, they're learning to build houses. And then, you know, three years later, five years later, they haven't done anything. And they're like, well, I'm still looking for the perfect place. You know, uh, I need a place in the woods next to the ocean by a waterfall on top of Starbucks. And I need it for five dollars, you know, and, you know, you can't. It, nothing will ever be perfect. Yeah. So <laughs> you just got to start going. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And, you know, two things I want to say about that. 
You know, one, I used to always say that uh, this is not a belief I hold anymore, but I used to always say humans were from a different planet. And I said that for the exact same reasons you just said. But what I realized was, you know, it's because humans migrated. So, like, you know, you got Africa. Now, people think of Africa, they think of um, pretty much the grasslands. Mm -hmm. But Africa is such a diverse um, continent. You've got the mountains, you know, that snow in some places. You got, like, you have all these different places. And so you got all these diverse different types of humans in one location. And so, like you were saying, though, but when they were in this location, you would not need, you know, a coat. Certainly wouldn't need a coat. You certainly would not need to worry about freezing outside and things of that nature. And what happens is, and this is all creatures on this planet, sometimes you migrate to a place that maybe you shouldn't have migrated because people always ask, like, why didn't the humans who moved all the way up into, you know, uh, Asia, why they just turn around? And I'm like... <laughs> I'm like, well, they were moving up in there for thousands of years, you know? And so it's not like they were like, had this destination in, in mind. They were just exploring. And some of them were probably following animals, but some of them, just like we are, are just explorers. They wanted to see what's out there, what's on the other side. And some humans actually got stuck out there during, you know, the last ice age. They literally got stuck. And then, like you said, it, 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 it changes humans, you know? Um, it becomes about survival. And one of the yeah. misconceptions, you know, and I and I only have to talk about this because in films, I always talk about hunter-gatherers. One of the biggest misconceptions about hunter-gatherers is that they were very primi primitive and technically by definition, the primitive, the first of anything is prime, mm -hmm. but they think of primitive in a very like lacking state. And right. that is far from the truth. In fact, hunter-gatherers right. had bigger brains than me and you have, right? Mm -hmm. They had bigger brains bigger heads and and honestly they're finding out that a lot of um you know like the stone hedge was built by hunter gatherers mm -hmm. now when people first hear that they go that that's impossible but we only say that's impossible because in school we were told hunter gatherers were spending <laughs> all their time trying to survive right but the more anthropologists study hunter gatherers today in south america and in, in africa what they find out is because those is not a lot left but what they find out is no, they spend most of the day in leisure. Mm -hmm. They only spend two yeah. to three hours a day, yeah. you know, hunting and foraging. The rest of the day they spend making things. And in fact, they will be able to make incredible things. But the reason why a lot of them can is because, again, agriculturalists and the civilized throughout history do not like hunter gatherers. They no, no. Out. And, and that's yeah. going on right now. Um, I visited yep. Paraguay when I was looking for land and alternatives oh, to, awesome. to this uh, the American nightmare. And what I found is that there's a group of Mennonites, which is basically kind of like the Amish, but they'll use technology as long as it doesn't entrap them, right? Um, so they took a part of the country that, that everybody said was impossible, nobody wanted it, and they became the single largest producers of vegetables, beef, and meat, uh, meat uh, of the whole country. And now uh, our government, who's supposedly anti-Christian, is funding Christian missionaries to go into this area because they're trying to get the the natives landed and at an address um and so they're now beginning to settle that area but it, it just makes me think that some of this culture that's moved out over the world maybe you get these little power structures building up and you know somebody does something great one day and then they start realizing they can have power over other people and not do anything and so basically they do they are going after those hunter gatherers and in the childhood where I grew up, I grew up in a kind of the, you know, in a place that's basically 10 years back from where most of the country was, you know, when the rest of the countries had phone lines, we had none. Then we got one phone line for the whole neighborhood, you know, where you could hear somebody listen in on every conversation, but the trees were so big, six people holding hands, uh, it could reach around one tree. And then of course they came in and bulldozed that. But at the time that I grew up, I was able to just walk through the land. I had it started off early in the season with eating greens, uh, and then toward the end of school, you had blackberries, wild strawberries, then the grapes came on, the plums came on, the pears came on, like there was always something you could go hunt and gather. And yeah, most of your day is spent running through the woods in just joyous laughter, having a good time and not working. And, mm -hmm. and he, yeah, and so I got a taste of that, and it's like, that's the good life, man. I mean, 
That's the good line. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, do, do you really want to go to work uh, or, or even, even gardening out here? We're doing like a, uh, it's like aquaponics on the bottom and organic soil on the top. So it's like a wicking bed and we use ducks to drive the fertility. But honestly, like you said, two or three hours a day, gosh, that would be kind of a busy day for gardening, but that's all you put into growing the foods you need to eat. And then what do you do the rest of the day? You go enjoy it. You you get yeah. curious. What's over that next hill? I don't know, but I'm going to go find out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's funny because, you know, I always say that the um, the matrix is just constantly brainwashing. The reason why I call it the matrix and not the government or the elitist, because these ideas right can be found in civilizations like for example i always i always talk about this um with my um with my friends who um who believe like europe was the only like ones acting this way in the world and i try to tell people it's not about being european it's not about being asian it's not about being african none of that it's about civilization growing crops agriculture as soon as you create the crops and the farming, you have to think differently yeah. because the matrix, agriculture, industrial, all these things, they take up where they're at and they expand outward. So they got to expand outward. Right. And so that automatically creates a context of violence. Right. How? Because I'm going to run into animals that, that are not agreeable with what I'm trying to create. Right. I'm going to run into other humans that are not agreeable with what I'm trying to create. So it becomes, but then it, now I've created a, a, a surplus of, of human population that does not know how to hunt and gather and um, that must eat from the crops. And right. so now I can't just go, let's just stop doing this, man. You know, I don't want to <laughs> kill anybody. Now yeah. it's like, no, we're going to expand out and we're going to expand and we're going to become a kingdom and then an empire and then, you know, so on and so forth. And so, you know, eventually you are going to get a group that takes that expansion and decides, why stop here? Or they expand so much. You know, one of the one of the worst things um, about what happened in particular in Europe is that we can't even figure out what a lot of the hunter gatherers in Europe believed because of the civilizations there. Um, in South America, the civilized used to take the hunter gatherers and sacrifice them. Yeah. you know um you know to their deities these are real things that was going on in different parts of the world they weren't talking to each other they weren't commu these civilizations weren't communicating but it's a pattern of behavior that you develop with agriculture mm -hmm. and um and so that's why the food force you know in films is the most important part you have to develop a food force because you can put wildlife in your food force to hunt and you obviously have wild fruits and vegetables to eat. And if you got one acre, eat just one acre, it's going to be a substantial game changer and life changer. You know, one acre um, of a food forest can feed 50 plus people. Right. You know, um, you know, and so that's and, and like you said, the whole nine to five. And I'm sure, you know, but I'm saying this for the people who are going to be watching this. You know, that was, it was just made up, guys. We have, we, humans literally been here. If you want to go all the way back to archaic humans, to Homo erectus, humans have been here for 2 million years. Mm -hmm. Humans like me and you, you know, with families, right? You know, me and you, 2 yeah. million years. Yeah. You know, employment has been here for 300 years. You know, in <laughs> right. most, uh, most places, only 200 years. Yeah. So that's not us. And mm -hmm. they have to brainwash us. I was a teacher for years. I didn't even realize I was doing it, but we're brainwashed kids. We give them a paper and say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Right. And the reason why I say grow up like that is because if you do, if you reject careerism, right? When you're growing up and a, a lot of us has teenagers, like, I don't want to do that stuff. They'll say, you need to grow up. Right. <laughs> right. So right. It becomes this thing where it's like, no, it's not that I need to grow up is I'm having a hard time assimilating to the civilized mindset. Because mm -hmm. like you said, when we're kids, you know, your body doesn't know anything about civilization. So your body comes here expecting what it's evolved for, which is living a life out in the wild, a good life, you know, to, you know, but instead what you get is this concrete life where they're telling you the only way you'll make it in this world is if you find a boss and you work for the boss for the rest yeah. of your life. 
Well, you know, something that really got me is I was in construction for in, in various forms for most of my life. And um, it was weird. I would build someone else a, a million and a half, two million dollar house. But because I was so trained up in that garbage, it never dawned on me. You know what? I could build houses and sell them and keep the profit myself. I mean, I know that seems stupid, but you I know how. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I just literally was just doing the program. And I know a lot of people are terrified about starting their own business. But the reality is somehow you always have enough. Um, you know, like, I wouldn't go back to work a job now, no matter what. I mean, I learned there's 12 wild vegetables that grow from Arctic Circle to Arctic Circle, including dandelions that everybody's trying to poison out of existence. There's just food everywhere. And mm -hmm. You just got to let go of the fear. You got to begin to just bring value. And I can't help but ask the question, what would life look like and what's the proper balance? Like I could conceivably, I've got books on how to forge uh, metals, how to literally start with charcoal and make tools and make a drill press and make a lathe and then manufacture and melt. And then you go all the way up. I mean, you could, they've got desktop CNC machines, 3D printers. Like we could have a technological approach and we could still have cars and stuff. And we could do that for ourselves in a community. But then is that even really necessary? Like what would life look like on the opposite side of that? Because on the opposite side, I don't need the money. I don't need the job. I don't need permission first. As long as I can secure a little piece of land, then I can basically provide everything that I need right there. And so that puts you back in, like I say, a pre-1800s kind of lifestyle. But is that really so wrong? You know, wow. like. It, I don't think it's wrong at all. One of the things that I talk about in, uh, you know, in films, because it's the modern, the modern society part which is very important to me because, you know, what I tell people is, you know, I don't believe that you need most of the tech. I would say about 95% of the technology that we have now is completely useless. Right. And this only here because, you know, a marketing, I, I am in marketing. I've been in marketing for years. I've marketed for different clients, you know, and um, I found out through learning about marketing, through learning about branding, that most of the things that you think that you need to buy, you've been brainwashed. Literally, right. you have been brainwashed. Not even like metaphorically from a very young age, you were shown this over and over. Like, so, like for example, it's like, why do you drink soda? You find out when I was in sports, my coach said, soda doesn't hydrate you. Yeah. I'm like, really? No, it doesn't. I, I, I'm like, that just seems so hard to believe. Why was that so hard for me to believe? Because every commercial, somebody would be tired and sweating and they would, <laughs> take you know a soda to the head and so you know that's what i thought i went to the store i would buy orange soda grape soda for a game of basketball which makes no sense right. but in your mind it makes sense so in that same way a lot of our technologies are like that the one what i tell people is like in regards to technology when it comes to films is you want to keep the technology that Im improves the quality of living of humans but also is either good or neutral to the earth and um because humans have always been um technological uh creatures right. you know a bow and arrow is extremely technological yeah. you know for us now we're just like oh not a big deal because we got, we got machine guns but for its time right we got to judge everything for its time for its time period that was extremely advanced and, you know, um, our technology was also, we thought about technology differently. Mm -hmm. Like, and what I mean by that is like, for us at that time, a pond was technology. Mm -hmm. A food forest was technology. The Amazon rainforest is a food forest that was created by hunter-gatherers. This recently came out, I think only about a year or two ago, but that the, the entire Amazon rainforest started with being grown by um, hunter-gatherers and the reason why I bring that up is because our idea of advanced technology is that of a warlord. Like right. our technology, transportation is the number one thing we judge, you know. Are we going to be able to travel to different galaxies? That right. only means something for creatures that want to colonize different planets. That sort of technology yeah. means nothing to something that has no interest in, in, in colonizing. Oh, how powerful are their weapons? That only means something to you know creatures 
who are war bound, like ants are, right? Right. That doesn't mean anything to a creature that doesn't think about war all the time. So that's why people say mm -hmm. that, you know, those hunter gatherers in South America, they were so primitive. I'm sorry, but creating the, the rainforest in order to have somewhere to always have shelter and food does not sound primitive to me. That sounds extremely advanced, you know. It, it um, is. Well, you know, like <laughs> Native Americans planted stuff as they went. There used to be food just dripping everywhere you went, and they thought they were stupid because they didn't farm. They didn't farm because they transformed, transformed the whole country into a farm, <laughs> you know. So, you know, and then they, we came in with this industrial mindset and this warring mindset. We cut down every chestnut. They, they, they literally made an order to destroy every American chestnut. There was more food produced in the form of chestnuts than we could ever produce in corn today, and they just they just destroyed it. But the bottom line is, I think that we have to we have to take back that power to ourselves. We've got to, you know, separate ourselves from that imperialist mindset and go after. Honestly, I think a lot of it is just it's actually built into us if we just learn to listen to it. Yeah, um, so this this recording uh, it's got about seven minutes left. So uh, uh, do you want to uh, uh, give a plug for your uh, your book and what you're doing exactly there? Yeah, yeah, I'll just explain. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you know, fams, uh, this book is really um just the first book, but the only book you'll really need. I know I'm not supposed to say that as somebody who's <laughs> gonna probably sell two or three of these books, but um, no, it's uh, it's 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 really it. Um, because by the end of the day, I'm not, you know, I have other streams of income. Fams for me is uh. It's my life work, it's my mission. It's like, it is not even like, it's the reason I'm here. And so, you know, ultimately to put it in a nutshell is FAMS is Food Forest Foraging, Hunting Anti-Fragile Modern Society. The food forest is to completely destroy any concept of poverty. Poverty is based on complete food production. How much food do you have, uh, food and shelter that is. And so if you have a mechanism in which everyone can eat, then you automatically cut off. Um, and what we all should want to do is cut off the power of the matrix of uh, civilization itself, because civilization in the matrix uses you as a battery pack for production. It ultimately just wants to grow. It's, it's, it's a mindless entity. It just wants to grow and spread out as much as it can. And when it's done with Earth, and you already hear scientists talking like this, it's, they're going to want to move on to another planet. And they're going to want to start over and do the same thing. They're literally eyeing Mars, which is so odd um, <laughs> yeah. to do that on. And then you have uh, foraging and hunting, as we talked about. Your body expects to be a forager and hunter. The reason why obesity and chronic illnesses are going up and depression, and then they'll tell, I mean, any psychologist will tell you, are you getting exercise? Are you going outside? How much sun are you getting? Are you eating fruits? Are you eating vegetables? And so your body has this expectation. Any creature on this planet that you do not give what it needs, which is its environment, because an organism is its environment, an environment is the organisms. And right. so, you know, once you take out of, you know, people have to walk their dogs all the time because wild dogs and canine expect to walk far distances. Yeah. And if you don't, they suffer from cancer, chronic illnesses like obesity and depression as well. <clears throat> and so, you know, those are very important. And then you have... Um, anti-fragility and i meant to hit on this in the beginning because you asked me about it but it was uh you know you have um anybody can go read any of the books from nasim um but you know you have uh fragile things robust things and anti-fragile things uh, something fragile you introduce chaos to it it breaks easily yeah. something robust you introduce chaos to it it normally stays the same for long periods of time and something anti-fragile like your body you introduce chaos to it and it tends to get stronger through the breaking process, right. which is, you know, which you want your society to be that way. We talk about how Egypt was here for, you know, 5,000 years, mm -hmm. 10,000 years, forgetting that you have hunter-gatherer societies has been here for over 40,000 years. Right. And that's because they are anti-fragile. The average lifespan of a civilization is 350 years. Yeah. And so that brings me to, you know, modern society, as we talked about, you know, um, I'm not asking people to give up having air in their house having electricity, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what everybody yeah. thinks. Yeah, you don't have to. Yeah, you don't have to. You can still have all those things and we can do it in a way that's also good for us and good for the earth. You can have yes. all those things. 
And so ultimately, FAMS is a way out of the matrix. And I truly believe, and I want to work with you. I want to talk to you more because, you know, uh, right now um, I am looking for land. I have my own food forest and everything. Awesome. But I was thinking that hard about it at the time. I was renting the place. I thought they were going to let us rent it for a while. The economy got weird. They wanted yeah. to sell the house. And so I lost my all my work. Uh, I, I know the feeling because we, we moved away from a property that was beginning to be swallowed up by a town. And we had 400 fruit, nut, and trees, and shrubs on that thing. And and now, you know, it's dripping with fruit. And, of course, if I go turn around and sell it soon, it's probably just going to get bulldozed so somebody can oh, yeah. do the usual. Um oh, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're teaching people to build their own houses, not just with air creep. That's just something that, you know, if you want something that needs little maintenance, then it's it's really hard to beat the price of something that's readily available off the shelf. You can build with raw earth for free. Uh, it's just that it requires regular ongoing maintenance, which isn't necessarily a problem. But, you know, while there's still money, while there's still all this going on, it kind of makes sense to strike that balance there and use what is at your disposal to create something that's going to endure uh, and protect you from the elements. So I think that, um, you know, your message is very much right on, uh, right on to where I want to, to see more people move because I want to see people prosper. You know, there's a, there's a guy that talks about how in order to be healthy, you have to go out and do what hunter gatherers did. You need to run, you need to hunt something, you need to move your body. I mean, deer, you, they'll shake, they'll shake their fear off and then they're fine. And then humans are just like, I'm going to be adulterated, <clears throat> an adult. I'm just going to swallow it, you know, and, and, and you know, um, and, and that's just the way it's been. I think, again, we're being programmed to be that way because, you know, yeah. um, you know, just to remind everybody before I go, because we only got one minute left, you know, um, hunter gatherers often had to be forced into civilizations, you know, but on the other side, people in civilizations used to flee to be a part of hunter gatherer groups. And when they were brought back to the civilized, they used to run away back to the hunter-gatherer groups, you know, yeah. just simply because once you get a taste of true freedom, it's mm. just so hard to let that thing go. And that's, and that's what we all deserve. You know, we, 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 we're, we have a born right to that. We do. And, um, that's important. And you can find me on TikTok, the philosophy of order, or, you know, God told me on, on YouTube as well. I just got started on the YouTube, so. All right. Well, guys, uh, check out his channels and subscribe to him. Um, consider getting his book because it's good stuff. And, you know, as we all get together, we'll begin to experience that. I got to experience it in South America. And when every man and woman has a mango tree with 2000 pounds of fruit and the freedom to follow their heart, there's really nothing that can compare to that. Nothing can replace that. We just have to rewild back to something that's less fragile. <laughs> Most definitely. Most, and it's been great being on here. I really want to talk to you more, though. Okay, so really this, this, will, this will end, and if I can't restart this Zoom, I'll just send my personal Zoom link, and then we can continue the chat. <laughs> yeah, okay. Just, uh, sure. But yeah, I mean,